Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm very sorry for the circumstances uh, under which I'm uh, speaking to you. Um, here in Canada, we are very concerned about the uh, war in uh, Ukraine. We uh, have uh, 1.4 million people of uh, Ukrainian uh, ancestry here in Canada, uh, and more, uh, more Ukrainian people than anywhere other than the Ukraine and Russia. And so there is great concern here in Canada about your circumstances there. I'll speak at the end about some opportunities uh, that uh, uh, are being provided by the Canadian government. Uh, for education and uh, and uh, other, which is a very broad topic, uh, where we take advantage of uh, the ability to create a very low radioactivity environment and do experiments that are uh, unique in their nature. Let me share the screen to start the uh, the lecture. Um, I hope that you're now seeing uh, my screen. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, fine. Very good. So as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, situated in an underground location in Canada. We also work with uh, uh, people in other underground laboratories, particularly uh, at the, under the Grand Sasso Mountain in the western part of uh, Italy. But uh, we are two kilometers underground in a, an otherwise active nickel mine, still extracting many tons of ore a day from the uh, mine. Uh, starting back in 1990, we built a, a very large detector. The person you see here is to scale. It's the size of a 10-story building, and it's ultra clean. In 2003, we expanded the laboratory with this additional region which enables us to do other experiments. And by having a, a very deep laboratory like this, we are able to uh, study particles that penetrate easily through the rock, whereas the cosmic rays, uh, which uh, otherwise would uh, uh, be uh, interfering with our experiments, are shielded out by the rock. We also make the entire area ultra clean to prevent local radioactivity and choose carefully the materials in the detectors. By doing this uh, <clears throat> uh, work underground, we can study things that span the whole uh, universe. Uh, for example, we study particles called neutrinos that come from the sun. And in the process, we've learned properties of those particles, uh, basic properties of the neutrinos that were previously unknown. That's what the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded for. But also we are able to confirm that we know the, in detail, the mechanisms that uh, power the sun, the nuclear reactions that power the sun and how they take place in the, in the sun, which is of value when we attempt to do fusion power here on Earth and make similar calculations. We can study the Earth itself by studying neutrinos that are emitted by radioactivity in the Earth, such as comes from uranium and thorium. We're able to observe hundreds of kilometers into the Earth uh, for that uranium and thorium profile. And that de delivers about 40% of the heat load that uh, uh, emanates from the earth and also uh, uh, is a part of the balance that keeps the central core of the earth molten. We study the Milky Way galaxy because we are now looking for dark matter particles that are necessary to keep the Milky Way in its uh, <clears throat> current configuration through their gravity. We study far distant reaches of the universe because the same dark matter has an influence on the uh, dynamics of what's happening in the rest of the universe 
including how it has evolved from the very early days. And so the evolution of the universe is one of the topics that we study. So let me speak about a few of these topics and let you understand how we're able to do science that basically covers the entire universe. Snow Lab is the name of the laboratory we have in Canada. It is, <clears throat> along with one in China, uh, the one with the lowest cosmic ray background uh, in the world. We study how stars like our sun burn. Uh, we study the basic laws of physics and we study the composition of the universe and how it has evolved to the present time. <clears throat> so let me start with a uh, discussion of what we know in particle physics, or at least a model that fits a large fraction of what we have observed so far. It involves quarks and particles called leptons, which are electrons and similar particles, muons and tau particles that are observed only at higher energies because they are more massive in the case than they are for the electron. There are particles called neutrinos that correspond to each of those uh, leptons. And these neutrinos are very, very difficult to observe. Uh, we do not experience them in our daily life, but they are very important in understanding how the sun burns and also they are important in terms of the evolution of the universe. They only feel the weak force and the force of gravity, and they're produced in forms of radioactivity here on Earth, uh, beta decay in particular, or in the nuclear reactions that power the sun. We know that they have a very small mass, actually, as a result of the measurements that we've made and other ones that have been made in Japan and elsewhere but we only have a very small limit on what that mass is, uh, almost a million times smaller than the mass of an electron. The quarks uh, come in various types. In particular, uh, they come in what we call three generations. The first generation involves what we call up and down quarks, which are the quarks that make up protons and neutrons that are the, in the core of an atom, in the nucleus of an atom. Three quarks come together to form either a proton with charge one or a neutral neutron. The uh, charges of quarks are one third the charge of an electron. There are heavier versions that have been observed in high energy experiments and accelerators and in cosmic rays. There are also known to be four forces, although this model unifies them uh, to a large degree. The electromagnetic force that really is what affects your life significantly in that it affects the chemistry of all the atoms from which we are made and which we experience, but also uh, electricity uh, that you use in your daily life uh, through the movement of electrons, this electromagnetic force has a, a photon of light that uh, is, is the, called the, the force carrier. For the strong interaction that binds together the quarks into the neutrons and protons and binds them into the nucleus, the carrier is a so-called gluon. And for the third interaction, the weak interaction, there are carriers that are neutral in the case of the Z boson or charged in the case of the W. You heard about the Higgs boson perhaps, particularly a few years ago when it was first observed overtly at the Large Hadron Collider, the highest energy accelerator in the world uh, at CERN in Geneva. This Higgs boson gives mass to all of the uh, particles in this uh, set that I have been describing, with the exception of neutrinos that are receiving their mass through a, a different mechanism. And the graviton, which uh, is a particle, which is the force carrier for gravity, which has not yet been incorporated into this standard model and is of the objective and is the objective of 
future work. Each one of these particles has an antimatter particle, a particle such that if you encounter that particle with one of the matter particles, the two annihilate each other as it is stated. In other words, the mass that's represented by these particles is converted into energy. The antimatter particle, for example, for the electron is the positron. And you perhaps have heard of positron emission tomography in which uh, positrons from a radioactive source are injected into uh, people's bloodstream. And the two gamma rays that are emitted back to back when uh, the annihilation takes place uh, are used to track where the annihilation took place and image in the body where those chemicals have gone. There are now, we think, particles known as dark matter that are different from any of the particles that you see in this so-called standard model of elementary particles, a new form of matter, in other words. But five times as much of this dark matter exists than the matter of which we are composed. As a result, it's a tremendous interest in physics to observe this clearly but it also is of tremendous interest for those who are studying how the universe has evolved, which is a study known as cosmology, because it has a profound influence in that case. The uh, physics of dark matter is not known, but it is assumed that there will be some interaction of these particles with matter. And assuming that, we are looking in our underground location, free of as, as much as we can of other interferences from normal radioactivity. Uh, we're looking for the interaction of these dark matter particles that we know are present in our, in our Milky Way galaxy with the particles that, are make, that make up our detectors. And so we're looking for direct evidence for the dark matter particles which are known to exist because of their gravitational effects. At the CERN accelerator, the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, at CERN, attempts are being made to produce these particles with the assumption that the particles are so massive <clears throat> that there needs to be enough energy to produce them for the first time since the Big Bang. The ones we looked at that are look for that are holding together our galaxy, we assume were produced in the tremendous amount of energy there was in the original Big Bang. At the Large Hadron Collider, the attempt is to produce them on Earth for the first time, hopefully by having enough energy to do so. Let me speak about neutrinos then, which are unusual particles. Um, they're basic particles. We don't know how to subdivide them any further. We don't know, of course, whether that scheme that I just showed you of the quarks and, and leptons is in fact the ultimate in terms of the microscopic uh, world uh, on which our world is based. We simply say that we don't know how to subdivide those particles any further as of today. Neutrinos come in three flavors and they only feel the weak force. So therefore, they'll only stop if they hit the nucleus of an atom or an electron head on. Therefore, they pass through an amount of lead corresponding to the distance that light travels in a year. In other words, a million billion kilometers of lead with only a 50% chance of striking something. This makes them very difficult to detect. That's why our detectors are the size of a 10-story building. And their properties have been, made, have, have been the least known among the basic particles. On the other hand, there are enormous numbers of them produced in the nuclear reactions that power the sun. And if you can detect them, then uh, you are able to understand from the very core of the sun how the power is being generated. Standard model in its initial form said that 
they should not change from the electron flavor into the muon or, or tau flavor. But that's exactly what we and uh, another experiment in Japan uh, observed in our measurements. And that is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for. It's a new property of neutrinos. And it is also uh, a property that implies that they have a mass which is greater than zero. This is the detector that we built two kilometers underground in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. It's an enormous tank of, of what's called heavy water. It's deuterium oxide rather than hydrogen oxide. Each of the hydrogen nuclei has an extra neutron in the nucleus, which doesn't change its chemical properties significantly, but which adds to the mass, and hence the term heavy water. We were able to borrow $300 million worth of that heavy water for use in this experiment over about 10 years uh, on loan from the Canadian government, which uses them in the Canadian style of nuclear reactor as a so-called moderator. In other words, slowing down the neutrons produced after uranium fission to make that make those neutrons uh, higher in probability for producing another fission and maintaining the chain reaction. These, this central volume of heavy water is contained in a acrylic container, <clears throat> five centimeters thick, 12 meters in diameter, an enormous bubble put together out of 120 pieces in this underground location, because those are the pieces that would fit in the elevator or cage, as we call it, going down into the mine. They're looked at by about 10,000 light sensors. And outside this volume, there is ultra pure light water. All of the water is purified to about a billion times purer than the best tap water. And it's all contained within a cavity, which is 34 meters high. 22 meters in diameter and watertight and also radon tight because we don't want radon to be getting into our detector and interfering with our signals. This shows you the enormous construction project to build this acrylic sphere out of 120 pieces to put in the light sensors, which you see here looking in at the central volume. And finally, to connect everything via these cables <clears> that go to our com computers for obtaining the data. Everyone coming in to work on the project from the time in which we had the walls sealed with Urolon plastic, took a shower and wore lint-free clothing. We filter the air to an extreme degree and we had less than one gram of dust on the entire detector thereby reducing the possible contribution from radioactivity. So this is a little video of two nuclei fusing in the sun, emitting a neutrino, which happens to be heading towards Sudbury, passing through the, the uh, solar system, as you saw, going underground, past the various parts of our mine, and eventually reaching our detector. That neutrino produces a burst of light, but even with this 10-story building size detector, we were only able to observe one neutrino an hour from uh, the neutrinos that are produced in the sun, even though there are roughly uh, 5 billion of these neutrinos going through every square centimeter of your body at, at right now. Our measurements were very clear. We measured in the red, as you see here, this is a measure of the so-called neutrino flux, number of neutrinos uh, per square centimeter per second, measured by knowing the probability of them interacting with the deuterium in the heavy water. And on the right, 
we on the left rather in the red, you see the number that are specifically electron neutrinos, the type produced in the core of the sun. On the right is a measurement of the sum of all three neutrino types with equal probability, which we were able to observe. It's essentially the reaction that breaks deuterium into a neutron and a proton. Three times as many were observed in the sum of all three types as in the electron neutrinos alone. That value for the sum of all types agrees with what's, what, what is the prediction from the solar model of how many neutrinos should be produced. There's less than one chance in 10 million that the remainder of these electron neutrinos had not changed into other neutrino types. That's five sigma, five standard deviations, which has been the criterion for a discovery in particle physics. So only one third of the total are still electron neutrinos by the time they reach the earth. The mechanism that, uh, causes that is for the neutrinos to have finite mass. And uh, that was proven by our measurements and also measurements by the Super Cameo Candy experiment, looking at neutrinos produced in the atmosphere. Why is this of value? Well, it's of, ver of great value in understanding on a very basic level, what our universe is composed of and how neutrinos fit into that. And so, that's number one on the list that I have here. It also shows that the calculations of how neutrinos are produced in the fusion reactions that power the sun are of great accuracy. And those are the calculations that are used to design fusion power reactors, such as the ITER reactor that is being built uh, in France by an international consortium. And so it's a benefit to mankind as well, because such fusion power can be generated from the deuterium in the oceans. And one in 6,000 of the water molecules in the ocean are heavy water. And so it's an almost unlimited energy supply and relatively clean. By determining a limit on the mass of neutrinos, we know that they are not the dark matter particles that fill the spaces between the stars in our galaxies. And therefore, that leads to the next set of measurements that we are doing at Snow Lab. First one of these deals with neutrinos. We have reloaded the snow detector by putting in liquid scintillator which is lighter than the surrounding water and therefore requires these red hold down ropes that you see here. We have now done that and we are prepared to put in a, an ice, uh, well, a natural tellurium that has a substantial amount of an isotope that can perhaps provide neutrinoless double beta decay. A very rare radioactivity that would enable us to determine the absolute mass of the neutrinos for which we only have a limit at the present time. The mechanism <clears throat> by which we would detect it is to observe a peak at the end of a spectrum of neutrinos that come from two successive emissions of both electrons and neutrinos in what's called beta decay. If this is to occur, it is because the neutrino is its own antiparticle, and the neutrino that would have been emitted is absorbed, reabsorbed by annihilating <clears throat> with an anti neutrino in the nucleus. This property of neutrinos is a fundamental one that is quite possible for neutral particles, and which uh, may be an explanation for why we now have a matter dominated universe. And you see almost no antimatter except in radioactive decay. I'll come back to that when we talk about dark matter. You have to measure 
a large amount of material for a long time in order to make a sensitive measure of the mass, 10 to the 26 years. In other words, many times Avogadro's number of, uh, uh, of atoms, which is around 10 to the 24 atoms per gram. And uh, we do that by having many tons of material in our detectors of interest both for basic physics and also for cosmology. This is this red signal is what we would see against the background if we were to observe something at the current limit for neutrino mass in our experiment. And we have the potential to improve that by a factor of six or more in future measurements by putting in more tellurium. So let's switch now to a discussion of dark matter, but let's, let's talk about it in terms of our current knowledge of the way in which the universe has evolved. Um, in particular, uh, we think that about 13.6 billion years ago, there was an enormous, effectively an explosion. The, the world started to expand very rapidly. And in the initial phases, there was tremendous heat. Energy was being converted in that heat into finite mass. And so the very basic particles, the quarks, the electrons, the neutrinos were produced individually. And after about a microsecond or so, as the world expanded following this enormous initial expansion, we come to a point where things had cooled off enough, mind you, they're still at 10 to the 13 degrees Celsius, but we have it cool enough that the neutrons and protons can form quarks. After three minutes, those quarks are in the neutrons and protons and can form nuclei. And after about 300,000 years, you then can form neutral atoms. That's a point at which we can see through the universe and because it becomes transparent. After about a billion years, you have the formation of stars, uh, proto galaxies and galaxies. And now the present time, we have the universe that comprises what we see when we look out on a dark night. Many questions still prevail with respect to this. We think that back in this initial process, there would have been similar amounts of matter and antimatter produced. This is the sort of thing that happens in reverse when a positron finds an electron and produces pure energy. We would have thought that back in the early universe, there would have been the same number of positrons and electrons as energy is converted into matter. However, we see almost no positrons except in radioactive decay. We think the mechanisms that it can explain this involve neutrinos and perhaps can be understood if we can understand the properties of neutrinos that might be shown by observing neutrinoless double beta decay. At the point where <clears throat> the universe becomes transparent, you can see the leftover photons from the original the Big Bang, which caused the called the cosmic background radiation. It's in microwave frequencies, and it's measured exquisitely and tells us a lot about how the universe has evolved. Dark matter is a major question in both um, physics, cosmology, and astronomy these days. We think there are there is about five times as much as the mass of glowing matter that we're made of. This shows you the exquisite measurements that have been made of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which shows a, a distribution pattern which can be expressed in Legendre polynomials as a function of, of, of angle, essentially. And what you see is here, a set of measurements made by satellites, such as the Planck satellite, but also a theory 
a theoretical line that goes through all of those points that has in it components, including ordinary matter of the, of the type we are made, but also dark matter. And the different components of this uh, distribution are influenced differently by the different types of matter. We also have strong evidence in, our, in galaxies like our Milky Way, which are elliptical in this pattern. They look kind of like a, a, a cinnamon roll uh, where uh, uh, the stars in the outer regions for which the profile is presented here of their velocities are going much faster than you might expect if you simply had the glowing matter influencing how they're moving based on holding them in place through gravitational attraction. The implication is that there is dark matter, as I said, more than five times as much as ordinary matter, which would be in a profile of mass that looks like the second black line here. And that fits the data very well. Similar things are observed uh, through a process called gravitational lensing using Einstein's general relativity that indicates that there is a similar excess of dark matter in even the far distant parts of the universe. We think the composition of, of the universe today is about 4% matter, about 20%, 26% dark matter, and about 70% dark energy, which is a way of representing what has been a recent discovery that gravity is not always attractive. There's a small component that is repulsive that has resulted in the acceleration of stars uh, following the initial Big Bang that is measurable at large distances and results in a uh, component of uh, Einstein's general relativity that can be added and also represented as a, a mass energy term to make up the full universe. One of the forms that dark matter could be is weakly interacting massive particles. Neutrinos are weakly interacting, but these particles would be much more massive than neutrinos. And we are able to look for them in our underground laboratory because they are expected to pass through the ground above us, strike our detector and make signals that we, are, we can observe. The initial, th this shows you Snow Lab as one example of an underground laboratory. It is uh, composed of the original snow cavern, as you can see here, and on the same level, two kilometers deep, there has been an excavation of uh, a number of other chambers where we can situate uh, experiments which are predominantly dark matter experiments using different materials. The uh, deep experiment uses liquid argon. The PICO experiment looks for bubbles produced by the interaction of uh, dark matter particles. The super CDMS will use uh, solid state detectors. This shows you how clean the lab is and how big it is. And a, a famous visitor who came underground in September 2012, as well as previously in 1998, Stephen Hawking, uh, for whom we had to take special uh, care uh, to uh, vacuum him and his wheel wheelchair because he obviously wasn't able to take a shower uh, easily once he got underground as everyone else did. This is what the deep experiment looked like, very similar to the snow experiment with light sensors. You see the back of them here, looking in at about a two meter diameter sphere of liquid argon, which is about 200 degrees Celsius below zero, uh, and looking for very faint traces of, of light produced by the interaction of uh, argon of, of argon with dark matter particles that are passing through. 
This experiment at Snow Lab with three tons of liquid argon has been very successful in demonstrating the technology. And there is now a collaboration of 400 or more scientists looking to use liquid argon for uh, measuring dark matter in, in this case, the underground laboratory in Italy at the Gran Sasso laboratory with the objective eventually of coming back to an even larger detector of up to 400 tons at Snow Lab to push to the point where neutrinos, ironically, neutrinos are the background to limit our experiments. Argon is a very valuable way to look for dark matter because nuclear recoils, argon nuclei recoiling after being hit by a wimp, much like a, a billiard ball or a pool ball, they produce light in about 10 nanoseconds. Whereas ionization produced by beta particles from radioactivity or gammas emit their light over 500 times longer. And by digitizing the pulses, we can tell the difference. This is what the new detector that is just starting construction at uh, CERN with 100 tons of dark matter of, of, of argon will look like. And we are, well, let me, let me tell you a bit about this. Um, in 2020, uh, this says 2021, in 2020, at, uh, that's a misprint, at the start of the uh, pandemic, a number of the scientists who were doing basic science within this large dark side collaboration came together with others from national labs in, in a number of countries. And in about eight months, we had certification and the ability to react to a Government of Canada contract to produce around 7,000 ventilators to be used uh, for COVID, particularly for patients who are in the most serious condition in the ICU. And as of right now, these are in the Canadian stockpile. There is an excess and the Canadian government is looking to donate, the, don, <laughs> donate those to countries in need. This shows you profiles of the pressure which would be provided to a patient's lungs by the device. Uh, and all of that was done in a hurry by scientists who were very motivated to try to make a contribution to help in the pandemic. So my conclusions, I hope I've shown you that science can be fun, that it is valuable to be curious and, and to pursue as much as you can about the universe around you. I happen to work in particle physics. There are many other areas of science in which you can make substantial contributions either to the basics or to pushing technology to make things that would be a valuable uh, contribution to society. So let me now speak for a moment about opportunities in Canada for future study in universities. Uh, the university I uh, am associated with, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. It's about two hours from Toronto in the essentially uh, near the center of the country. Has a program which is particularly tailored to people who have been forced to move, uh, including uh, most recently targeting people from Ukraine. The idea is to provide opportunities for people to study in Canada at Queens, uh, to perhaps go to university in the Ukraine and share uh, supervision with uh, professors at Queens. Uh, and there are so there is support from Canadian funding agencies. I will make this, these transparencies or these slides available so that you can see these links. For the Queen's Principles Global Fellows and Scholars Program, the contact is global at queensu.ca. 
But as I said, the Canadian government has been supplying Ukraine with uh, weapons and other humanitarian aid to deal with the horrendous situation you find yourself in, in the war, but also providing a particularly uh, rapid uh, response to uh, people who are choosing to emigrate to Canada, uh, either temporarily uh, or for study purposes or even for longer term. Uh, the, the links to such programs <clears throat> are listed here. There are special immigration measures for Ukrainians, as you see in the last item, and there's a support program of $3,000 to every Ukrainian person coming to Canada. So that's the science we do. It's fun. I hope I can inspire you in spite of your present difficulties to be inspired to work in science and technology going forward. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about any element of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great lecture. It was a big pleasure to hear you to be with you today. Yeah, we have some questions, like the first one, uh, how to differ atmospheric neutrino uh, apart uh, from the solar bombs? Well, it really depends upon the energy of the neutrinos. In an, in an energy region, uh, which is uh, about, uh, let me uh, say about uh, 20, from, from an energy corresponding to about 20 times the electron mass uh, and lower than that, the numbers of neutrinos reaching the earth are dominated by neutrinos from the sun. For higher energies, they are dominated by neutrinos that are produced by high energy cosmic rays, high energy protons or other particles produced in, uh, in uh, uh, astronomical uh, situations uh, and uh, bombarding our atmosphere, which then interact with the atmosphere and produce uh, higher energy neutrinos, uh, very often muon uh, neutrinos, along with electron neutrinos. And so it's really on the basis of energy or on the amount of light that would be generated in a detector, such as the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. All right. Is it possible to accelerate neutrino uh, to the speed of light? Um, we think the neutrinos have a finite mass. One of the reasons we think that is that they oscillate. When they oscillate, they are essentially keeping track of the time that has elapsed from when they were produced to when they were detected. If they were traveling at the speed of light, they would not be able to keep track of time in that way. That's the way special relativity works. And therefore, they must be traveling slower than the speed of light, which is the way in which, or at least one way in which, we infer that they have a mass which is greater than zero. Because particles that have a mass that is greater than zero must travel slower than the speed of light because it would take an infinite amount of energy for them to reach the speed of light. All right, very similar, like an adding to this question. Uh, will it possible to confirm existence uh, of Tycon or uh, faster than light uh, than light uh, particle in the future? None have been observed, uh, to my knowledge, at this point. There are processes that happen that are not, let's say, externally detectable, that happen within uh, the theoretical mechanisms within a within various processes that sometimes appear to uh, produce uh, uh, particles that are exchanged with other particles at faster than the speed of light. But to my knowledge, there is nothing that has been observed that travels faster than the speed of light. All right. 
one more question into this topic. Are that me there are means to, to discern the light flashes produced by the electron neutrinos and other flavors of the neutrinos? Yes. Uh, heavy water uh, has an extra neutron in the nucleus. There is one mechanism in which an electron neutrino comes in, interacts with that extra neutron, and converts it to a proton and a fast-moving electron. That fast-moving electron, if it's moving, well, if it's at a high, high enough energy, which many of them are, to be traveling faster than the speed of light in water, or heavy water in this case, will produce something uh, in the form of a cone of light. It's somewhat like a sonic boom for a, uh, uh, an airplane that travels faster than the speed of sound. But in this case, it's light. It's a cone of light and it is detectable. For a second reaction on deuterium, any type of neutrino can break deuterium apart into a neutron and a proton simply by scattering off it with enough energy. That freed neutron in the heavy water is the way in which we infer that that reaction has taken place. And we had three different techniques for observing those neutrons. The final one of which was to instrument the detector with a set of individual neutron detectors of a total of about a half a kilometer of such detectors with very low radioactivity. You have to be very careful because gamma rays from the decay of uranium or thorium can, can mimic that process of, of splitting the deuterium apart and producing a free neutron. And so we limited the radioactivity in the water to less than a billion times less than typical purified water at the point of one radioactive decay per day, per ton of water from uranium and thorium. And we measured it to be sure that that was not what we were observing. And so those two ways of detecting specifically electron neutrinos or all neutrino types are very different from each other and they can be discerned between each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one more question. Is it possible for matter made from uh, second or third generation particles to exist? Is it possible for what made from? Uh, the matter made from the, uh, the second and third generations. Um, it certainly would be possible for matter made from those generations to exist, but um, the uh, way in which such generations were detected was the observation of individual particles uh, in high energy collisions that uh, occur from cosmic rays or from high energy accelerators. Um, therefore, there have not been uh, accumulations of such particles uh, with enough uh, energy to, uh, well, with enough accumulation of mass to produce matter from these particles. And in any case, the individual particles themselves being more massive than lighter particles like up and down quarks, for example, will ultimately decay into those other particles because it's energetically allowed. And uh, therefore, if such matter were to be created, it would be relatively short-lived in its nature. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great lecture. It was a great pleasure to hear you and see you today. Uh, I hope that very soon mm, that everything will be fine and that there will be peace. And maybe uh, one day uh, we'll come here in Kiev and provide in-person lecture. Also visit our uh, science museum that we have in Kiev. I hope that we'll be very soon. It would be a pleasure to do that. And it certainly is, uh, uh, I'm honored to be asked to do this lecture to you. And I, 
I wish every one of you the best. I hope that you will be able to stay safe. And I hope that this uh, barbaric war will be over soon with uh, strong success by Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the lecture and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.